Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 21, August 16th through August 22nd, 1861. Last week, the Battle of Wilson's Creek took up our time with the first major battle of the Trans-Mississippi. This week, I want to begin with the aftermath of the battle and talk a little bit about its significance. Native American involvement is also something I want to discuss, as well as the mutiny of the 79th New York, which occurred last week. At the end of the episode, I want to get into Civil War medicine, uh, at least briefly. Now, at the conclusion of the Battle of Wilson's Creek, not much is gained by the side of the Confederates or the side of the Union. In fact, as we mentioned, the Northern forces had essentially accomplished their original goal of being able to retreat safely away from the rebels. Springfield was soon occupied by the Confederates, with the body of Nathaniel Lyon actually being left behind. He would be recovered by relatives and taken back to Connecticut for a burial. Price and McCullough had worked well together during the battle, but tensions grew soon after. Sterling Price would move his forces deeper into Missouri to collect more volunteers, and McCullough would withdraw into Arkansas once again. Price's account of the battle was published first in the paper, and if not outright critical of the performance of the Confederate regular troops, was much more complimentary of the Missouri state troops. The battle did have the effect of a rump session of the Missouri legislation, which chose to side with the Confederacy. From then on after, the Confederate flag would contain a star for the cave state. Siegel, oddly enough, would actually see his star rise. Sturgis would turn over command back to the German, who would, in marching to Rolla, show blatant favoritism toward his own Missouri volunteers. It is important to mention that when an army marches, it is often strung out for several miles. Passing one point may take several hours, depending on the size of the army. Siegel places his men at the front of the column each day so that they were first to make camp and receive the best sights. It was custom to actually rotate units when marching, so it was a more democratic, more fair process. Siegel would continue to command troops throughout the war, but his status as a political general is well sealed after the Battle of Wilson's Creek. We will see this supporting cast of characters fairly soon, if not now, at least in early 1862. So way back in episode one, when I mentioned the Trail of Tears and the fact that many of those tribes had integrated well into Southern culture, I mentioned that this was going to play a part in our future story. It would surprise you to maybe know that Old Ben, or Ben McCullough, was interested in protecting the Indian Territory of Oklahoma. The Texan had been working closely with a man named Albert Pike to secure treaties with the tribes there. Pike was actually born in Boston in 1809. Before the war, he had been staunchly anti-secession, but rather than turn his back on his new home state of Arkansas, he decided to join the Southern cause. On August 15th, 1861, he was commissioned a Brigadier General and would be sent to negotiate with the tribes and recruit for Southern regiments. After many of those recruits switched sides during the war, he was accused of treason by Confederate generals and resigned. After the war, he was big into Freemasonry. It may surprise you to know some 28,000 Native Americans served for both sides during the war, but most of them serve on the side of the Confederacy. There were some who aided Union troops in their invasions of the South on the Union side. When the Union Army actually allowed the former slaves and free blacks to join under the designation of colored regiments, there was no differentiation in this designation from Native Americans who would serve in many of these units. The Battle of Wilson's Creek is a great example for involvement on the Confederate side. It was reported that a contingent of Cherokees showed up at the Confederate camp to join the Western Army. 
Greer's Texas Cavalry writes that while they traveled through Indian territory, two Choctaws joined them. But why? Well, we already mentioned that some of these tribes had members who were slaveholders and identified better with the Confederate States. There was rightfully also a disenchantment with the federal government, and if there was a chance that the Confederate States would recognize the tribes to the degree that the U.S. government was unwilling to, then putting their lot in with the South seemed preferable. We will talk a little more about the Cherokee involvement, but by this point, Pike had secured agreements with the Chickasaws and Choctaws. On August 13, 1861, we have the Mutiny of the 79th New York. This regiment was actually mentioned before in our story and contained mostly Scottish immigrants. It had been commanded by the Secretary of War's brother, who died at First Manassas. The regiment suffered many casualties during the engagement, included, as mentioned, the death of their commander, James Cameron. The 79th would complain about lack of supplies, including blankets and tents, upon their arrival to Washington, and their brigade commander, one William T. Sherman, was relatively unsympathetic. If you remember his quote from his introduction episode, William T. Sherman did not think highly of the volunteer regiments. Still, they were told that the regiment would return to New York for recruiting purposes, but rather than the whole regiment, it was decided that only one officer would be sent back. The combination of a lack of proper equipment and a denial of a trip home drove some men to get drunk in the nation's capital. Isaac Stevens had been appointed to command the regiment, contradictory to previous instructions that the men would elect their officers. As we mentioned, this was actually an early war custom. The 79th was told that they would be placed in a brigade under the command of Daniel Sickles. Dan Sickles is an interesting character. He was a senator from New York and also very much a political appointee general. Sickles has the distinction of using the excuse of temporary insanity in a murder trial. He actually shot dead the son of Francis Scott Key in Washington, who apparently was involved with his wife. Another fun fact was that the legal team was headed by Edwin Stanton and included the Irish general Thomas Francis Marr. So unliked was Sickles that the regiment would openly boo and hiss him whenever cited. On the 13th, Stevens arrived, and many officers immediately resigned. When told to break camp, the soldiers mutinied and would not pack any equipment. The issue was actually escalated all the way up to George B. McClellan. The commander of the army was more than willing to use force to break the 79th and put them back into line. Sufficient troops were given to Stevens, who was then able to take control of the unit without any bloodshed. Many of the mutineers were arrested, but only 14 were sent to Fort Jefferson in Florida for fatigue duty, returning in early 1862. Despite this dark mark on the record, the 79th would fight in many of the major battles in the Eastern Theater and perform well. This incident is a good example of of the low morale that faced the Union forces gathered in Washington. Poor performances in the field were powerful in terms of the esprit de corps of the whole army. It is also a good example of the kind of issues faced by McClellan when organizing the regiments into what would eventually become the Army of the Potomac. Now, I think there is a lot of misconceptions revolving around Civil War era medicine and battlefield surgeries. Now that we have had two major battles, we can get into those practices and maybe talk about those misconceptions. If you were to say that disease and unsanitary conditions were rampant during the war, this would be correct. We have mentioned before that disease killed more soldiers than the battlefield. Camps and hospitals early in the war were cramped spaces. Waste from soldiers and animals was often not far from living and sleeping quarters. Many soldiers came from rural environments 
and we're not used to these close quarters of living such as in winter camps. There were no vaccines as there are today. Combine that with a poor diet and the recipe is set for disaster. Vermin would be prevalent in the tighter areas and could be used to spread disease in this way. Certainly, as the war progresses, the lack of proper clothing and shoes could be an additional factor, especially for the Confederacy. Germ theory was not a thing during the war, and the concept of where disease came from varied. There was a bad air theory, meaning that they were airborne, which is, you know, sort of true, but not fleshed out all the way. We are not too far removed from even more practices we would think of crazy uh, today, like, say, bloodletting or the use of mercury. During the war, great strides are made in the field of medicine, but unfortunately, it was a learned process. There was very little concept of sanitation early during the war, but it would at least progress. Reliving here in the age of COVID-19 would find it crazy to think that we would not wash our hands or use sanitizer every five minutes back in the day. The use of opium in the war was used for several ailments. Quinine was used for malaria. The Confederacy, in certain cases, did experiment with herbal remedies, but all too often, they would simply use captured Union medical supplies. Care for soldiers was done using a triage system. Field hospitals and advanced aid stations were used on the battlefield. Jonathan Letterman would be the medical director for the Army of the Potomac, and he would come up with this idea. Ambulances would be used in the field in some cases to transport the wounded. Because of the triage, more severe wounds would be dealt with, hopefully faster, while less serious wounds could be sorted. Oftentimes, whiskey or morphine was given to the men for the pain. This triage system is still used today and has its roots in the Civil War. As the war progressed, larger and more technologically advanced hospitals were developed. In fact, it was far better to be wounded toward the end of the war than it was in the beginning. We talked about the large hospital setup at Chimborazo in Richmond. Oftentimes, many cities and dwellings near battlefields would be used as hospitals. The farmhouses that we mentioned during our talk on Wilson's Creek, for instance, were used in this way. Buildings used as hospitals would be marked with a yellow flag so as to avoid taking fire from either side. Springfield, Missouri, it was said, was set up like a giant hospital in and of itself. Even long after the armies left, these communities would be left to deal with the aftermath. Now, let's talk about amputations. When one usually thinks of amputations in the Civil War, they see a guy on a table with like 10 orderlies holding him down, and the doctor comes in with like a massive saw and says, bite down on this, and they hold out a wooden handle or something, and then uh, they start to go to town on the poor guy's leg, and he's screaming his head off, and yeah, that's usually the, the probably the picture that I would say you know most people see when they're thinking about amputations. And I'm sorry if perhaps maybe in visualizing that I didn't realize maybe I should have had a little disclaimer that um, if you were eating, maybe uh, skip this part or, or save it for later, but uh, we'll, we'll continue. So let's get a few facts down. Number one, most of the amputations were done using anesthesia, mostly in the form of chloroform. There are 800,000 cases of anesthesia used during the war, 75% of which were done with chloroform. But why amputation? Which, I would agree, seems a little barbaric in today's age. One of those sort of outdated practices, perhaps, uh, that we talk, just talked about here in the last uh, section. It is partly due to the advancement in military technology. The mini ball, fired through a rifled musket, was much more powerful. If it impacted with a leg or an arm, it was likely to shatter the bone. These rounds were also made of lead. 
rather than risk death through infection, amputation was seen as the safest procedure to ensure survival. Some 60,000 or so occurred during the war. A surgeon on average would have three assistants. And while yes, there was usually a saw involved, not to get too graphic yet again, but a scalpel and a Catlin knife were used for skin and muscle before the bone. A tourniquet was used to stop bleeding, and oftentimes the wound would heal on its own, or there was a method using excess skin called the flap method. Again, sorry for the visual. It really depended on where the amputation was, like how close to the torso, as well as other factors such as poor nutrition and blood loss. But another misconception would be that the amputation would result almost certainly in death. 75% of amputees would actually survive. Within 48 hours, there was a much higher chance of survival. Still, there were these negative images of surgeons during the war, or sawbones, as they came to be known, in the slang there. Here is a quote from a Union general at Gettysburg. There stood the surgeons, their sleeves rolled up to their elbows, their knives not seldom between their teeth. The surgeon snatched his knife from between his teeth, wiped it rapidly once or twice across his bloodstained apron, and the cutting began. Then operation accomplished, the surgeon would look around with a deep sigh, and then next. Here is a quote from Jonathan Letterman, dispelling the image that doctors were butchers, though. The surgery of these battlefields has been pronounced butchery. Gross misrepresentations of the conduct of medical officers have been made and scattered broadcast over the country, causing deep and heart-rending anxiety to those who had friends or relatives in the army who might at any moment require the services of a surgeon. It is not to be supposed that there were no incompetent surgeons in the army. It is certainly true that there were, but these sweeping denunciations against a class of men who will favorably compare with the military surgeons of any country because of the incompetency and shortcomings of a few are wrong and do injustice to a body of men who have labored faithfully and well. It was an amazing strain on the surgeons during the war. As it progressed, any amputation could be completed in as little as 10 minutes. It should be noted that their sacrifice in seeing such terrible sights would be recorded in their memoirs. I think it is also interesting to note, and this is something that we discussed in our first memoir review, or at least it was in the first memoir, and maybe I didn't get to touch on it, perhaps, uh, so if I just misspoke, I apologize, but um, there is a definite, let's say, uh, ill feeling by surgeons toward those who are perhaps trying to get out of uh, duty. They're you know, cowards, shall we say. There's also this sort of sense of um, justice, perhaps, from them. And part of it, I think, is because of the sort of the, the heaviness of the work, like the, the sort of intensity of their of their job, right? Um, where they come across individuals who perhaps, um, and there are accounts of, of soldiers who would uh, maybe shoot themselves in the foot or, or, or have a self-sustained injury. And in the memoir, it's actually mentioned how the surgeons realize a particular individual that comes in um, has done this and they, they handle him fairly roughly. Uh, in the process. So um, I think it's sort of interesting to see sort of, in my mind, that's sort of the toll uh, that they are taking um, when conducting, uh, you know, these, these procedures. So uh, just, just sort of an interesting note. On a positive note, though, by the end of the war, large-scale hospitals had advanced to the point where there was only a 9% mortality rate. If not advances in science, then we can safely conclude that there were advances in organization and continued interest in specialization. Plastic surgery, orthopedic medicine, and neurosurgery would see boosts after the Civil War.
So let's leave it off there. We went a little shorter today, but covered a good amount. We talked about the significance of the Battle of Wilson's Creek, as well as the involvement of Native Americans during that battle, and the part they will continue to play during the war. We also covered the 79th New York Mutiny, and dove into some Civil War medicine. Next week, we will talk about the Union striking back in the naval action off Cape Hatteras. If you like what you hear, please be sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, uh, the Patreon, as well as Venmo information posted. And we will be posting our second Patreon episode, the a Patreon episode for this uh, month, which should be a movie review. We're going to watch The Jayhawkers and hopefully go over uh, that film and how it relates to our story. Any kind of feedback is greatly appreciated questions comments concerns all welcome the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com thank you all so much for listening and have a great week